told that this is the 158th anniversary of Abraham Lincoln's speech at Gettysburg, which is um, a great entree to your talk. We hope your talk will be as good as uh, Lincoln's speech. Uh, uh, Blake, we're really honored to have you here. Uh, he's a Maryland boy, grew up in, or born in Baltimore, grew up in rural Maryland. Uh, he went to uh, Maryland University, uh, worked as an electrician full-time, uh, received varsity letters in high school and college, was an Eagle Scout, uh, did medical school at the Universi Universidad Centrale del Este, and then came back, completed a medicine residency at Greater Baltimore, chief residency, did a double fellowship in cardiology and cardiac electrophysiology at Penn State, and then was recruited to University of Toledo, where in 11 years he became full professor of medicine and, and pediatrics. In his spare time, uh, he's authored over 250 peer-reviewed articles, 34 book chapters, co-editor of a book, Syncope, Mechanisms and Management, and also author of another book called The Fainting Phenomenon. He was senior editor of the journal pacing and clinical electrophysiology for 25 years and is director of the cardiac electrophysiology program and the syncope and autonomic disorders clinic at Toledo. He is the world's expert on postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. And tonight he's going to opine upon the influence of the autonomic nervous system, or of autoimmunity on the autonomic nervous system. Now, on a personal level, Blair, as you might know when talking to him, is a compassionate doctor. He's been awarded the Leonard Toe Humanism Medicine Award in 2006. He was the Shining Star Award for Toledo Medical Center for Outstanding Medical Care. He's published numerous poems, essays on what it's like to be a physician and a patient in a collection called The Calling. He was voted Distinguished University Professor by Un University of Toledo in 2009. He was the Dysautonomia International Physician of the Year for four years running. He received the university's Outstanding Research and Scholarship Award in 2017. He was voted as the Medical Professional of the Decade by the British Arrhythmia Alliance and voted by the Ohio State Senate is one of our finest citizens. 2020, uh, he was presented with the Blair P. Grubb Endowed Chair in Syncope and Arrhythmias. And this year, he was given the university's President, President's Award for creative and scholarly activity. You are one of America's top doctors. You are one of the most sought after doctors in the country. We're very honored to have you here tonight, Blair. Thank you very much. It's an uh, honor to be able to be here and share my uh, research with you. Um, I didn't quite, I sometimes look back and wonder how I got where I was, and, uh, and uh, I really don't exactly know how it happened. One thing led to another. Um, so I started looking at patients who had syncope, and just so we all have the same definition of that, that's a transient loss of consciousness and postural tone with spontaneous recovery. It comes from this word, syncopa, which is a Greek word meaning to cut short. And um, there are a huge number of causes. Many of these, uh, the reason I got into it is I'm, heart, I'm a heart rhythm specialist as well as a pacing specialist. And many of these people had heart block or VT or something like that. But many of them, we realized, didn't have any of those, but we're still having recurrent episodes of syncope. And we, real, and we would uh, realize that they were having periods not only of, of periods of hypotension, but also their hearts would just stop for periods of time, for 20 or 30 seconds at a time, and there was nothing wrong with their heart. So it became very evident that it was something wrong with the way the brain was controlling the heart. So then we asked, well, how does the brain control the heart? And no one exactly seemed to know that answer. So I thought, well, that'd be a nice thing to know. Um, and so we started looking at this and doing a collaborative work with a number of people in neurology. The human nervous system, I'm gonna back up because this is a very mixed audience, is broken down in several different ways. One way is to break it between the central nervous system, which is the brain and spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, which is uh, broken down into two components, somatic, the part you have control over, and autonomic, the part you don't. 
The somatic nerves are hooked up in a pretty simplistic fax fashion. Every cell in the brain has one nerve that goes to one end organ. It's a linear system. One plus one equals two. That's why a good neurologist can look at you if you've had a stroke and tell you exactly what part of the brain was affected. However, this system would be inadequate for the autonomic system because the autonomic system has a hundredfold more to do at any moment. If you're laying perfectly motionless in bed and not moving at all, you're not using your somatic system at all. But you still have to breathe and your heart still has to beat and you have to maintain your blood pressure and your body temperature, all of that still has to run. So there isn't enough room in you to have a linear system do that. That'd be a function of like having every outlet in your home have a different wire coming off the electric pole. So what we have is what we've learned to do in our homes, which is have junction boxes. So each cell in the brain goes outside the brain and spinal cord to a ganglia, which is basically a junction box. And from there can go 20, 30, 40, or 50 nerves that go to 20, 30, 40, or 50 places. So literally one plus one can equal 50. It is a greater than logarithmic expansion. And it allows for very small amounts of neural tissue in the brain to control large numbers of functions simultaneously. But it also means if something goes wrong, a lot will go wrong simultaneously. And we learned that breakdowns can occur at the, at the brain level, at the ganglia level, or at the end organ level. Now the areas of the brain, there's a multiple areas of the brain that, that control this. If I give this talk to neurologists, I go into more detail, but for this audience tonight, Basically, I've colored the areas that are, that are involved in this, and incoming information regarding what your pressure is and other things is processed in the brainstem and the medulla in an area called the nucleus tractus solidaris. It's relayed up to the um, midbrain uh, in an area called the ventrolateral nucleus and ultimately to the hypothalamus. And the hypothalamus itself is composed of a number of subnuclei. These subnuclei have been mapped to do different things. But one of the problems that's existed in brain mapping up until the present is we've looked at things with a knockout model. We've either looked at what people have lost during a certain stroke or when we've destroyed something in an animal. The problem is that's not how it really works. For the first time in history, we can do functional brain mapping. We can look at the brain as it's doing functions. You can map people as they're reading, talking, doing mathematical equations, lifting or moving different things, and it turns out that multiple areas of the brain have to work simultaneously. Now, the areas that we mapped out are part of that circuit, but they're just part of it. So the American Academy of Neurology published a functional brain map several years ago, and it's a holographic image. The only way you can see it is, with, is a hologram. And when they had people talk or speak in a different language or sing, you can see that multiple areas of the brain are sending signals all back and forth all at the same time. It is a much more complicated interplay of systems than we originally thought. And this model is slowly being abandoned of the hypothalamus, that these are distinct things because it turns out they communicate back and forth with each other. In addition, the areas of the brain that are involved in emotional control sit right here so that those areas are hardwired into the hypothalamus and can override whatever it's doing. So this is what the system controls. Heart rate, blood pressure, body temperature, bowel motility, sweating, breathing, genital urinary function, and they control them all simultaneously. You cannot change anything without changing everything. It functions as a single unit. Many people now consider the autonomic system as another organ. It works like a server in a computer network. Its job is to keep everything coordinated. Now, traditionally, we've broken this down into two functional groups, sympathetic and parasympathetic. This is based on the work of Cannon in the 1920s, who was looking at what was then called the vegetative nervous system. And as happenstance would have it, he was at lunch, and one of his friends was a classics professor. And he was talking about some of his research, mapping out some of the what we now call the sympathetic chords. And he, the guy he was talking to was a historian of ancient Rome whose specialty was Galen. And he was talking about this and he said, well, you know, that's really weird, you know, because Galen described this in 200 AD. Now, Galen was like the team doctor for the gladiators. He was not allowed to do human autopsies. That was forbidden. He could do them on animals. But if somebody was cut open during a, during a combat, he could look inside. And he wrote and identified two chains of nerves running on either side of the spinal column, which he wrote he thought made the organs of the body work in sympathy with each other. 
So Cannon was so impressed when he learned that, he called it sympathetic. Uh, and then that's where the word came from. And then the parasympathetic just meant along with it. The N-terminals of the sympathetic system tend to use uh, norepinephrine to work. The N-terminals here use acetylcholine. But the ganglia of both systems use acetylcholine to work. Now, this model was all well and good until the mid-1980s when Dr. Jeffrey Bernstock at the University of London was looking at the autonomic innervation of the abdomen, the gut, the mesenteric area. And it turns out that the same nerves contain both acetylcholine and norepinephrine and can switch functions back and forth. What's that do to this model? Pretty much trashes it. <laughs> and uh, so we cheat. We say, well, we'll call that the enteric nervous system <laughs> since it doesn't fit. But it's becoming increasingly evident that this model needs to be changed. This is what we do all the time in science, right? We make a model based on what we know at the time. And then as we learn more, we say, uh, I don't know that this really works. And it turns out we found all other kind of neurotransmitters, that many of them only have letters and numbers identifying them. These are all critical in autonomic function. Well, where do they fit? They don't. <laughs> so we know the system has to be tweaked or possibly abandoned and some other system come up with. But at the moment, we don't know how to do it. And we don't know how to integrate all this information into a new model. So we keep using the old one because it sort of works. On the other hand, if you think of it like when you teach children atomic theory, you don't treat, teach them about electron clouds and probability of zones. You use that little orbital thing that looks like a solar system that nobody believe, has believed since 1920, you know, because it works. You, know, you can use it. How does the brain know what's going on? It basically looks, when it's looking at blood pressure, it looks at stretch. There are certain fibers which are unmyelinated C fibers called mechanoreceptors which line every blood vessel of the body. The majority of them, two-thirds of all the mechanoreceptors in the body are in the posterior aspects of the right and left ventricle. So your heart is your major blood pressure sensor. The second most frequent place is the aortic arch, third of the carotid bodies, but they're in every blood vessel. When they're stretched, they give off more electrical activity. The brain monitors that electrical activity as a reflection of blood pressure. It does it so it's like the how it's like looking at it. Then it sends out commands of what to do with that information, like raise this, lower that, change this, alter that. And then there's a feedback loop. So it's just like the machines we build. There's input, processing, output, feedback. The system can break at any point along the way and make it so it doesn't work. So this is a partial drawing of um, the autonomic system, which actually my daughter, who is an artist, uh, removed some of it because it was too, too many lines. And I showed this to my ex-son-in-law, um, who, <laughs> who was a, or still is, a Cisco systems designer. And he was astonished. He said, this is how we are wiring computer networks for artificial intelligence. He had never seen this before. And he was like, he actually had me print it so he could take it to work and show everybody. So we're figuring out how to do the thing that nature already figured out over evolutionary time. You know, because it works. These are overlapping, redundant, interconnected systems. And again, as I said, everything, to change anything, you must change everything simultaneously. So how does the system work in a practical basis? When you stand, two-thirds of your, I mean, one-third of your blood is pulled downward immediately by gravity, just immediately. And you have to respond to it immediately or everybody would pass out. What happens is when blood is pulled downward, there's a central point about which the pressure doesn't change. It's called the venous hydrostatic indifference point. It's roughly between the diaphragm and the belly button. And there's more stretch on the vasculature from here down and less stretch from there up. And what happens is it, it so selectively increases vasoconstriction from your waist down, but it increases heart rate and the force of myocardial contraction. And all three of those together pull blood up back up and you can stand successfully. Indeed, it works so quickly you can jump out of bed, jump out of a chair, do double backflips and your pressure will stay the same. Once you're upright, you must maintain it. If you can't, gravity wins, you lose. And more and more of your blood volume will be displaced downward. The more that's in the lower half of you, the less can be in the upper half of you. How you feel will be dependent upon how much displacement occurs. Small amount, you'll feel tired. More, 
you'll feel like you can't think, can't focus, can't concentrate, more still you'll get lightheaded, dizzy, more still you'll see black spots, get tunnel vision, more still you'll pass out. I went through this using lower body negative pressure, so we were doing this in normal people. It is a most unpleasant experience. Um, so humans are the only truly upright creatures on the planet. We're the only true two-legged creatures. And we have adaptations for that that no other animal has. One thing is we have venous valves. You may not be aware of this because we all learned this in medical school. Other animals don't have them. They don't need them. They're on all fours. They're dorsal. Our blood pressure regulating system was designed for an animal who is dorsal on all fours, where it works just great. However, being human and being upright and evolutionary wise has freed up our hands to do all kinds of things. It places our brains, the center of our humanity, at the most precarious of positions in maintaining adequate blood flow. So the two, especially when you go to run. So if you go to run, you've got a really problem. You want to arterially vasodilate to provide more oxygen to the actively metabolizing muscle, but that would drop your blood pressure. So we have something that animals don't. It's called the skeletal muscle pump. When you contract your leg muscles, and to a lesser extent the abdominal and arm muscles, it compresses veins and propels blood back to the heart. A healthy set of legs can raise your pressure 10 points. So it compensates for the arterial vasodilatation by, by pumping venous blood back to the heart. Now, most of us use this as a backup system when we're running. So what happens if you, if you have a runner? When they stop running is when they pass out. One of the fathers of autonomic research was Sir Roger Bannister, who was the first person to break the four minute mile. And he became interested in this when he crossed the finish line and passed out. <laughs> By the way, the co-father of, of autonomics is da David Streeton. And David Streeton was from South Africa and was a classmate of Sir Roger's and was in the same meet when he broke the four minute mile and he set a record in the javelin and his big complaint was nobody ever noticed. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he actually immigrated to the US and was at Syracuse and was an endocrinologist and started the autonomic research program there. So you're, you're, if you are got poor autonomic tone, you are dependent on your skeletal muscle pump. You may not realize it, but you're dependent. Most of us don't need it. I mean, sometimes when I operate, you know, and I'll, I'll do a biventricular ICD, there'll be a six hour procedure and I'm wearing a lead apron the whole time. You know, so most of us can get along without it. Um, but if you have autonomic insufficiency, you are dependent on it and if you take it away, you'll crash. So um, Dr. Richard Sutton and Dr. Rose Kenny, soon to be Sir Richard Sutton, uh, at the Westminster Hospital in England in 1985, came across the idea of turning off the, uh, turning off the skeletal muscle pump by putting somebody on a table and inclining them at 60 degrees with a footboard meant for weight bearing. At that angle, the only stress on you is gravity. Big deal. <laughs> like, no problem, unless your system doesn't work. And then it's a big deal because you will crash. And not only did it allow us having a diagnostic modality, but for the first time, we could measure something as it was occurring. We could provoke it at will. So we could measure EEGs and, and echocardiograms and blood for catecholamine levels and blood pressures and transthoracic impedance and abdominal impedance and sympathetic nerve traffic all at the same time. And what we learned is everything we thought we knew was wrong. You can say anything you want as long as nobody looks. I mean, heavens, we're in Washington, right? <laughs> so this is the second patient we ever did. The first patient was negative. This was a research test. This was the tracing of a nurse who was uh, employed by a local hospital and fired because she kept passing out. And this was a research test and she was referred to, and she had the billion dollar workup circa 1988, which is when this is from and uh, was referred to us and they told us, they told her what we tell everybody when we don't know what's wrong, you must be crazy. <laughs> um, so we tilt her and about, it was only like seven minutes into it, she suddenly said, I don't feel good, I think I'm going to, and at that point she lost consciousness and her blood pressure and heart rate go to zero. At that point she starts to have convulsive activity, is incontinent, and my nurse and I are standing there going, wow, that's pretty cool. <laughs> so after she peed all over herself, we said, well, maybe we should put her down. 
So he did, and you notice she gets a rebound hypertension. It's almost like a Samoji effect with blood sugar. If you would have found her laying on the floor and took her blood pressure, it would be high, okay? Because it produces an overcompensation. And this is what her heart rate did during the time. So when the, when the sympathetic withdrawal occurs, which is what's happening, then everything stops, including the heart. Um, now, my, one of my former fellows, who's now at the University of Mississippi, calculated that the length of the asystolic period that you'll see during tilt-table testing is directly dependent on the anal sphincter tone of the investigator. Um, <laughs> because the longer you keep them up, the longer it's going to be. Um, now, I didn't know what I was doing in 1988, not that I really do now, um, but we admitted this lady to the hospital because I was kind of freaked out by this, and she was nice enough, and we put a halter on her, and she was nice enough to pass out in front of the nursing station wearing her halter. And you can see that it looks pretty similar. By the way, don't be confused for those of you who are not uh, cardiologists. This is not an EKG complex. That's the artifact produced by her striking the floor. So we realized from these fortuitous recordings that we were reproducing something similar to what was happening in the real world and what the outside world was. Um, why do people care? Well, um, one of my my father's favorite uh, people was Will Rogers, and he kept telling me quotes for him all the time. And one of them was, it's not the fall that hurts, it's that sudden stop at the end. Um, so it's not a big deal unless you're her. And this is the wife of a CT surgeon who remembers standing at the sink doing dishes and woke up in the hospital. And she, what I reconstructed, I think happened, is she passed out, hit her jaw on the counter, broke it, flipped off and hit a table, and um, if you feel here, this area is called the zygomatic arch, and she crushed her zygomatic arch. And so ENT and ophthalmology spent the next four hours putting her face back together. So it's not a problem unless that's your wife or your mom. This is a kid from Cal, and I, I had some really gory ones, and I decided not to show those. Um, the, uh, this is a kid from California who kept passing out, and this is after one sinkable episode where she rolled down two flights of concrete steps at her school. And again, it's not a problem unless that's your kid. So we began to look at this, and I will start out by saying any system of classification is by its very nature arbitrary. You know, it's, some, it's us imposing our will upon nature. Uh, Werner Heisenberg first said that it was impossible to measure the speed and position of a particle at the same time, and that was actually the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. But he and other people later adapted it to say the very act of observing a phenomena can change it. So what you think, you think you're measuring actually nature and you're measuring your distortion of nature. So for example, I have one of my hobbies is trying to learn quantum physics. We now don't believe there is an electron until you stop it. Okay, the, the, it's like this probability zone or cloud an electron only comes into existence when you actually do something to stop it and make it be in one place. Um, so this is a quote, since the measuring device has been constructed by the observer, we have to remember that what we observe is not nature itself, but nature exposed to our method of questioning. So we began to see there were patterns during tilt, tilt and do syncope that were different from each other, and those different patterns seemed to correspond to the symptoms people were having. So we realized this wasn't one big group, but rather a whole bunch of things. And uh, my daughter actually did this uh, illustration. She's an artist. She did this illustration. And we began to break them down. And this, we developed a system, and this is now the nationally used system, uh, into three major groups, reflex syncopes, uh, postural tachycardia syndrome, and autonomic failure. The people who had neurocardiogenic syncope in between their episodes felt just <coughs> fine. And then suddenly, out of the blue, the system would just stop. They would fall like a tree, because they're, they're, they would go to zero blood pressure and zero heart rate. And if they didn't kill themselves when they hit the floor, when they woke up, they'd be just fine until their next one. It was almost like having epilepsy. Well, on the other hand, there were people who, uh, especially older patients, where the system died, okay? They were, they were always symptomatic. Every part of the autonomic system was failing. Many of these patients had other neurodegenerative disorders. The biggest group was Parkinson's disease, but other ones as well. And when you put them upright, all the blood in their body just drains to the lower half of them, and they, didn't make, they don't make any compensation. So there's no comp compensation of heart rate. There's nothing happens, and they just pass out. Um, 
It's another group was, this was a, a tracing from a ward clerk at our institution who had been a triathlete, actually ran in the Ironman triathlon in Hawaii. And she got a, she was fine, got a bad uh, infection one winter, and then said, I, I'm destroyed, I can't get out of bed, I try to walk across a room, I feel like my heart's beating out of my chest, um, I, I'm passing out multiple times. When we saw her, we tilted her, and you notice her heart rate goes from 70 to 160. Blood pressure falls a tad, not too much. And she said, oh my God, this is how I feel. I feel like my heart's beating out of my chest. I feel like I'm sweating all over. I can't catch my breath. And as we watched her, we noticed her feet were turning first red, then blue, then purple. And we said, wow, that's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> so we brought her back uh, the next day and we gave her technetium, which binds the red cells. So it's a radioactive tracer, binds the red cells, tilted her upright and put a gamma camera in front of her. So normally 15% of your blood volume is in her, on your lower extremities during, during upright posture and her it was 30. So she had twice as much blood as normal in the lower half of her body and it was a failure of vasoconstriction. Blood was draining downward and the brain was driving the heart to beat harder and faster. So I said there were three things that kept you upright. Heart rate, contractil myocardial contractility or inotropy and uh, vascular resistance. What happens in congestive heart failure? You lose contractility. So what do you do? You increase heart rate and increase vascular resistance. Here, you've lost vascular resistance. You increase heart rate and contractility. So these people are pulling blood in the lower half of their body excessively. And actually, most of it is in the mesenteric vasculature. It's one of the things we learned in the blood pooling studies. Because most of your blood is in the mesenteric vasculature. As a matter of fact, most of the blood in your body is in the abdominal area in the mesenteric vasculature. When you go into septic shock, that's where most of the blood is. You know, there's not enough room in your legs for that much blood. So this is an example. We did a, a series of, control, of studies with matched controls. Uh, this is a young woman who had a post-viral postural tachycardia syndrome. And you can see that compared to a matched control subject, her heart rates are much higher and her blood pressure is much lower. And you can watch the pooling occur. Um, when you tilt her upright, you can, this phenomenon is called acrocyanosis, and you can watch the blood pooling occur. And actually what you see on here, that's a string plethysmogram. It measures very small changes in diameter. So her leg actually swells as well. So the criteria that we came up with for this, and it was sort of, again, it's an arbitrary thing, we said that you had to achieve a 30 beat per minute increase in heart rate on standing or it hit a uh, heart rate of greater than 120. There has to be, technically, at first we said there has to be an absence of any underlying, uh, any known underlying cause. We've kind of modified that and we'll use a POTS-like state or syndrome. Um, and these are the kind of symptoms that people report. Uh, this is the percentage of people that will report a certain symptom. These in, like lightheadedness, dizziness, palpitations, exercise intolerance are all high ones on the list. Um, syncope isn't quite as common as uh, some of the other ones because they feel so badly they'll actually sit down and, and not stay up long enough to pass out. But what we've learned is this is a heterogeneous group of disorders with similar clinical characteristics. It is not one big happy family but rather a whole bunch of things can distort the normal compensatory responses to the upright posture. Again, as a cardiologist, if you look at congestive heart failure, there are like a hundred different causes of it. You know, there's not just a cause, but there are dozens and dozens of different ways to get to the same place. And this is a partial list. Um, and, you know, things we've identified. We were doing a lot of research with mitochondrial disorders. We've seen plenty of people with traumatic brain injury. Um, so, and I'm going to talk about autoimmunity. Um, this is Stephen Hawking, who um, I have a great admiration for, that he managed to live a, a very creative and full life despite a, a horrible illness. Um, he said the universe is analog, not digital. So the question we began to have is that the onset of many of the patients we saw, um, they would say, I was just fine. I had no problems in the world. I got this really bad infection, frequently an Epstein-Barr infection, by the way, and then everything fell apart. You know, I just, everything fell apart. And that's the classic story in autoimmune disorders. My current wife uh, was just fine, an athlete, you know, 
and got an Epstein-Barr infection and within a week developed full-blown rheumatoid arthritis. You know, every joint involved, every marker off the wall high. So again, that's how we know many autoimmune disorders occur. There's a phenomenon called molecular mimicry, where a virus gets into you by looking like you. That's how it doesn't get eaten right away. And when your system starts to go against it, it will sometimes go against parts of you that it came in disguised as. So the, we suspected there was an autoimmune basis. We also found that many of these patients had elevated ANAs, elevated C-reactive uh, uh, protein, elevated SED rates, nonspecific markers of some inflammatory state. Um, and then later I'll show you some research about the fact that these are not distinct groups but overlap. So just again, because it's a mixed audience, what is an autoimmune disorder? Um, antibodies are markers that tell, that bind to foreign things in the body and tell what are called B cells and T cells, which are called killer cells, come kill this. So the antibody doesn't do anything to you. It's a marker to come in and destroy that thing. Um, and an antigen is what it's trying to destroy. It's what, it what elicits an immune response by the body. And they're usually built in this structure, this kind of Y structure. So normally, they're designed to tag to bacteria or to viruses. The antibodies bind to them, and then the killer cells come in and kill whatever that is. Okay, that's how normal it is. But what happens is, because of this molecular mimicry process, um, for example, in type 1 diabetes, which is, one of the, which is an autoimmune disorder, we're now pretty sure that the culprit virus is a Coxsackie B virus, common cold virus. The way it gets into you is it looks like, and when I say looks like, the cell, there's a protein sequence on, the, on cells that says, I am a pancreatic cell, I am an islet cell, and I am you. Um, so it gets in you by looking like that. And so when your immune system responds to it, if it's not real careful, it'll kill anything that even resembles it, including your own islet cells. So that's what happens in most autoimmune problems, that, that it, something sets off a process where your antibodies start binding to parts of you. And by the way, frequently, it's not binding to a specific thing, but to a certain protein or a certain receptor. So for example, in rheumatoid arthritis, it's bound to a certain protein. Now, I know a lot about it because my wife has that. Your biggest problems in rheumatoid arthritis is your, the major cause of death is heart failure. The second major cause of death in rheumatoid arthritis is renal failure. The third is pulmonary failure. The joints are like your least of your problems. Why do we call it even arthritis? Because they want to change the name to rheumatoid disease. Because 100 years ago, doctors would look and all they could see were the joints. They couldn't measure any of that other stuff. They didn't even know it was happening. You know? But again, it's the least of your worries. That's why they jump on therapy so early in course now. So why did we think this again? And also the other thing is one third of all the patients had it would develop another autoimmune disorder such as Sjogren syndrome, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple sclerosis, et cetera. Indeed, there's a huge amount of literature. We wrote one article where many patients will start out with a POTS-like syndrome and then develop MS. So this, this was the, the sort of the holy grail that we started doing. The first person to do this was Steve Reno at the Mayo Clinic who published the first paper in the year 2000. And he found that there were autoantibodies in some patients, but again, only 5% of them, to postsynaptic acetylcholine receptors in the autonomic ganglia, very similar to a somatic disease called myasthenia gravis. Uh, and indeed, this would de-innervate these people. And this is a, um, a thermoregulatory sweat test. And you can see there was a correlation. When the antibody levels were very high, when this person was first diagnosed, they don't sweat at all from this part down. Later, a couple of years later, when they would recover, they would recover sweating back. The trouble is that this was, this was a major breakthrough. Steve is a brilliant guy. He's at the, he left Mayo and went to the University of Texas at Dallas Southwestern. Um, but again, it was a very small group of patients. Um, Dr. David Kem, who was at the uh, University of Oklahoma, uh, got the idea that there may be a so that was good for that small group. But he started looking at other things, and in a very small study, he thought that uh, many, the target site was alpha-1 adrenergic receptors. Unfortunately, do Dr. Kem was brilliant. He died at the first uh, onset of the COVID thing. He got, I literally, had a, I was talking to him on the phone like 
two weeks before, he got sick and died like within a week. Uh, and the program there was kind of falling apart. Um, so what are these things? So there's a whole bunch of receptors throughout the body that, that, that uh, modulate different functions. Um, the adrenergic receptors, there's uh, uh, six, maybe six type, alpha one and alpha two, uh, uh, and uh, beta receptor, any uh, receptor sites. And these will provoke either constriction or dilatation of the blood vessels, also increases in renal flow, et cetera. Um, so people began to look at these in a variety of different conditions, sometimes in postural tachycardia syndrome, but all these studies were extremely small, five patients, six patients. Here's a summary of them here. And again, nobody had done a lot of patients, they were doing little ones. And the other problem was we didn't have a good technology for doing this until about 10 years ago, when several new technologies came out to make it much cheaper and also much more accurate. Um, so that that people began to look and sort of try to figure out which, um, any, which receptors could be affected, and there probably there's a variety of them. Um, so some of these papers began to, again, show there were high levels of receptors, but they were, you know, some of these studies were five patients, six patients. So we published a study in 2019. We looked at 55 patients, and we found that 90% of them had, compared to anyone else, had high levels of circulating autoantibodies to alpha-1 receptors in the vascular smooth muscle. So if those alpha-1 receptors are blocked, vessels can't tighten. They also were in the gut. Many of these patients, they end up on feeding tubes, they get gastroparesis, severe colonic dysmotility. Um, so 90% of them had this. But we also, to our surprise, found that um, fifty percent of those also had muscarinic M4 receptor antibodies. Nobody understands the muscarinic receptors well, but the M4 receptors are in the brain and govern dopamine release, particularly in the basal ganglia. Some of the patients had everything elevated. We had seven patients where everything we measured was off the wall. These were all sick puppies. These are, I mean, again, we, we get a select group of people. We get people in wheelchairs. So these are not, you, our patient population is skewed. You know, nobody schleps their kid here from California unless they're really sick. Um, so this is a skewed population where you're looking at some of the worst of the worst people. And one of the cautions I give is these people may be different than the ones who aren't as, aren't as sick. You know, we measured all sick puppies. So again, we published this finding that this tremendous number of people had these uh, alpha-1 receptor antibodies. But we began to notice funky things in some of the studies. So my co-investigator is Dr. William Gunning, who's a uh, patho pathologist, who's both a hemopathologist and an immunopathologist. And he's one of the co-discoverers of a cl uh, clotting disorder called delta granule storage pool deficiency. And the de uh, delta granules are actually serotonin granules that are inside platelets. And if they're depleted, then the platelets will not clot together. It's almost like you're taking aspirin or Plavix or something, but even though you're not. He thought at first this was a hereditary disorder that was only present in maybe 2 to 3% of the population. But we had so many patients that would complain of bleeding. You know, so many of them would have, the women would have these mega super periods. People would have nosebleeds and things like that. Um, and we began to look at that and we found, we did a study with case controlled study and found that 80% of these patients had delta granule storage disease. That made no sense. It made no sense that it's hereditary either. So he said, this must be acquired and somehow the platelet is being activated in this autoimmune process. So we've later looked at this and we now are generating data which is, has implications far beyond any of this stuff just to how the immune system works, that platelets may actually be the first line of immunologic defense. And they release cytokine substances that trigger the rest of the, auto, uh, rest of the immune system to work. This was a study we published uh, where we uh, looked at a large uh, number of patients and we found, as I said, that 80% of them had depleted uh, granules in their platelets. So we think that the platelets play a major role in inflammatory states. 
Um, and we, this was a, a study that got a lot of uh, press in the immunologic literature. And again, we weren't looking for this per se, it's something we found that may have implications far beyond anything that we're doing. Now, the other thing we noted is many people had mast cell activation syndromes and many of the children would end up with a thing called eosinophilic esophagitis or gastritis. Eosinophils invade the esophagus or the stomach, these kids can no longer eat. They are dependent on feeding tubes to stay alive. Um, but it made no sense, like what is going on? And then we realized, well, if the innate immune system is involved, it would make perfect sense. What is the innate immune system? You have two parts of your immune system. The one you're used to thinking about is adaptive immunity. And that uses antibodies, T cells, and B cells. It was a guy named Rose at the Johns Hopkins Hospital 40, uh, 50 years ago who first proposed that the adaptive immune system could turn against you, and everybody thought he was nuts, you know, the usual thing. Um, and um, when you use the term autoimmune, it's specifically referring to the adaptive immune system turning against you. However, about 30, 25, 30 years ago, it was realized there was another component to the immune system that most of us haven't heard of called innate immunity. And it uses mast cells, eosinophils, basophils, and a group of chemicals called interleukins to work. They're also called cytokines. And if it turns against you, and about, 20, about 15 years ago, we first realized it could turn against you too, we use the term autoinflammatory. Now, it's confusing, don't ask me, I didn't make up the terms. Um, but we thought that perhaps these people had these other problems because they had an autoinflammatory state in addition. Um, so we did a study and this was during, so what had happened is we had drawn many more samples of blood than we could use and we just froze them and then COVID hit. Uh, and they wouldn't let us do any new research. But we went to the IRB and said, look, we got all this stuff in the freezer, can we play with it? And they said, yeah, you can play with that. Um, so we began to look at the, these frozen samples that were the same, some of the same patients that we had recruited for the first study. And we looked at a number of cytokines uh, that would be there. And to our amazement, virtually everything was elevated off the wall. Some things like tumor necrosis factor in these people were 50 times higher than controls, um, indicating there was an auto-inflammatory state. So we just sent away another study where we looked at 35 patients and had 35 match control patients and did an even broader array of, of cytokines and um, interleukin uh, things and we got the same exact result but even more so. Some of these were two and three times higher, some were up to 50 times higher. Um, so this paper is currently in review at the Journal of the American Heart Association and we're now in a, another trial where we're looking at three, three groups of people, normal controls, post-viral POTS, and post-COVID patients. Um, so we are, we are being flooded with post-COVID long-haul POTS patients. I think that there's exactly, just another virus that's triggering it. And so far, our preliminary data, what we're finding is the exact same thing. Adult rheumatoid arthritis is an auto-inflammatory state that then drives the autoimmune state. If you stop the auto-inflammatory state, the autoimmune state stops. All of the drugs you hear about for RA, uh, Humira, Cavazara, Embril, they target the auto-inflammatory response. They target tumor necrosis factor, and in the case of Humira, it's tumor necrosis factor. Cavazara targets interleukin-6. Um, these are all working at the level of uh, the auto-inflammatory response. And I think the exact same thing is happening here. Different, different cytokines are being activated, but the same kind of uh, thing. So I was going to share some of what um, the sort of electrician part of me. Um, so what we saw is that when we would tilt some of the POTS patients, they would go flatline into asystole. And frequently, these people gave us histories of passing out recurrently or having convulsive activity. Um, so the idea of being able to measure what's going on in the real world with your heart rate has been a goal for a long time. You'll hear the term Holter monitor. This is named after a real person. This is William Holter, and that was the first one. It was, six, it was 85 pounds. Um, 
And that's a motorcycle battery that he had to power it. <laughs> but he was an electrical engineer and a genius, and he got the thing down to about two pounds. Um, but it, again, it's a little limited. So um, I was one of the first people in North America to put in the, the device on the right, which is an implantable monitor. So it's an EKG you implant under the skin, and it records 24-7. It's now come out in a much smaller form. It's injected under the skin, and it's there like 24-7 for the next five years. Here's what it looks like on an x-ray. And this is an example of a POTS patient who said, I keep passing out, and the mother, would, it was a young woman, and he said, well, she, she's had this convulsive activity, we've taken her to neurology, they keep doing EEGs, they keep normal, but she passes out, has what looks like a tonic-clonic seizure, is incontinent of both, of both fecal matter and urine, um, and it's really stopped her life. So we put one of these in, and you know, in this study, we said, well, let's look at what's happening. You know, let's try to be good scientists and not, not to say the lady's crazy. Um, so this is one of her episodes. Now, this is the lead into it, um, and her heart rate's actually high but normal. And then suddenly, you can see it slows down and just stops for 38 seconds. You know, and then she hits the ground like a ton of bricks, and then finally wakes up. So we published a series of papers using this technology and shown that, that a subgroup of patients, and we only think it's about 10% or 15% of the POTS population, actually has an overlap with neurocardiogenic syncope. And in that subgroup, when you put in pacemakers, you can eliminate the, the convulsive syncopal events. They still have other symptoms. We can eliminate that. Uh, again, this was part of my research helping develop this pacemaker. I was, did it originally with a different company. Um, but basically, it can measure blood pressure. We now have pacemakers that can measure blood pressure. And it does so by, cre by creating a continuous electrical field between the tip of the, of the uh, pacing lead and the can, which sits up here. And um, when the heart is full of blood, it, the impedance to current flow is less than when it's empty. So on each beat of the heart, it gives you like a sine wave curve. When we put these in for the first 12 hours, it measures every heartbeat, makes, summates them into a template. And then we use that to be able to measure pressure. They'll work in 80% of patients. Um, uh, this is one of the papers we recently published on this. This is one I just, uh, it's sort of funky because I just had it in clinic right before I came here. Um, but this is someone, a POTS patient, who was kept passing out. And you can see this is not one, not one of his bad episodes, you know, and he just goes flatline. So these overlap with each other. This is a Venn diagram I stole from pulmonary because they use it to show the interrelationship between asthma, bronchitis, and emphysema. You know, and there you have people who are purely one, purely the other, but some people are a little one, little the other, and they've gotten to the point is, I don't care which one of those you are, really. You know, they throw this under the title COPD uh, because the therapies are the same and they, like, it gets too messy trying to figure it out. Like, you're in that area and I'm gonna treat you. Uh, and we see the same thing. I think this is a very useful way to look at these. So again, I'll give you an example. This is a 35-year-old uh, woman who um, underwent two orthopedic surgeries and after the second, and by the way, one of the provocateurs other than um, viral infections is surgery. But surgery is a well-known provocator of autoimmune states. Some of the first autoimmune diseases like Dressler syndrome were described after cardiac surgery when you cut the pericardium. Um, so she began to experience lightheadedness and she began to have syncope almost daily. And then she became bedridden. She was admitted to a very large, prestigious hospital, and I won't tell you the name, but it's located in Cleveland. Um, <laughs> and she spent a month there um, and they couldn't do anything for her and they just said, we have no idea what to do. Her family requested she be transferred to us, so she was uh, transferred after 30 days there on multiple therapies. And again, we tried her on multiple therapies as well, um, and she was just completely bedbound. If you try to get her up, her heart rate would go to 180, her pressure would go to zero, and she'd pass out. Um, so we started her on intravenous immunoglobin therapy, and she unfortunately got an aseptic meningitis at first, but we controlled that and within two days of starting this immunotherapy, she was able to sit up in bed for the first time in 40 days. Um, 
and uh, her drop in blood pressure minimized greatly. Now, she was very deconditioned from this. We kept up the IVIG infusions. We had to send her to a rehab hospital uh, where we had to build her up over several months. That's a picture of her hugging one of the rehab workers. Uh, but she's now home. She's still somewhat sick, but she's able to walk, function, do things on her own. So, um, as was mentioned, I sort of like poetry, um, and one of my favorite poets is T.S. Eliot, and this is from the Four Quartets. It's, and uh, I think it's ap apropos for what we're seeing because it says, we shall not cease from exploration, and the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and to know the place for the very first time. These disorders have always been here. You know, we just recognize them now and can finally see what's going on. Um, and oftentimes these people are not treated very well. I mean, they're told they're crazy, uh, they're, you know, they're just, they're, or they're just dismissed. I mean, they just say, you're too sick for our practice to deal with, and they just sort of say, you know, bye. Um, and it's, it's sometimes very disheartening to see how they're treated by the medical community. So um, there's a lot of work to do. Um, and in all of these things, because many times, the, often many of these disorders are not recognized by, by most medical people or forgotten about, and the people are treated extremely badly and they're just sort of end up disappearing. So what I'm showing you is the beginnings of what has become a new specialty of medicine. It overlaps, it's uh, jointly run by both neurology and cardiology. Um, and you can make a tremendous difference in the lives of these people. Uh, we're actually, if this continues, we're going to start trials of, of immunotherapy mm -hmm. using either Cubzara or I think Cubzara might be the best drug um, because it targets interleukin-6. Mm -hmm. Indeed, the post, um, so far, the post-COVID long haulers, the interleukin-6 levels are amazingly high. I mean, indicating some chronic inflammatory state that's been per uh, provoked by the COVID infection. Um, it's easy to be up here and do all this stuff, but you can't really do it unless you've got support. Um, and I've had been lucky enough to be married to two amazing women. My first wife, Barbara, was actually a pediatric resident at, with Dr. Carson at Hopkins um, when he was uh, a resident as well. Um, she died of a glioblastoma. Uh, I married one of her close friends, uh, who is Dr. Dean Eber, who's a professor of art at Bowling Green State University, who has been equally supportive. And I couldn't have done any of this without both of their supports. So thank you for letting me present this to you.